Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, F.J. Siami Construction, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Markham LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. You know, New York City, the country, people love retailing. People love shopping. They, they have to go around, you know. They're looking for bargains. They're looking for specialty stores. They're looking for the, the top retailers around the nation. And today I have the premier leasing person, the person who has personified leasing in New York and around the country, Robert Futterman, the chairman of Robert K. Futterman and Associates. Thanks for being here today. So, you're, you're 51 years of age, and like myself, but I didn't leave. You were born in Brooklyn, and I was born, and I lived near you because you were in Sheepshead Bay, and I was in Gravesend, and then you moved to Jericho. Right. Uh, and in Jericho, you went to Jericho High School. Yes. And you were saying to me during high school, you had a, a variety of odd jobs. What were you doing? Well, in high school, I was, uh, I remember. One of the first jobs I did was shining shoes at a barber shop where my dad got his hair cut. Then I was a busboy for a restaurant. And then I teamed up with some friends and went up to the Concord and parked cars and was a cocktail waiter. And then I became a, a waiter at during um, in Lake Placid right before the Olympics. So whatever I had to do. Now, also, it was interesting because leasing was probably the furthest thing away, and we'll, we'll get to that, because your dad was in the, the Christmas uh, season yeah. of lantern business. Right, Christmas decorations and patio, patio. Uh, patio lanterns, importing, exporting, but a factory, a warehouse, a, a, um, you know, um, a line that you would get, on an assembly line that, you know, not exactly the type of work I was looking to do. So you graduate from Jericho High School, and you go to University of Maryland. Yes. And now, here's the interesting situation. You know, you could have been the Ron Delsner of, of, of music. I mean, you, you, you went over there, and you were running an operation. You had 18,000 seat. One venue you had a 1,000 seat venue, and you were running a nonprofit. So tell us a little bit about well, uh, my, Robert Futterman, the, the agent. Well, going to, going to college was a great experience. But what I found was there was a niche business in college that I really took a liking to, and that was the concert promotion business. University of Maryland had a $100,000 budget, and we could book any of the top acts, like Elvis Costello, The Police, The Pretenders, The Grateful Dead, and compete with the local big promoter, Celador Productions, who was booking venues in Washington, D.C. By being 20 minutes out of D.C. in Maryland, we could compete. And I had an office. I had three secretaries. I was on the student government. I was like, get me Irv Azoff on the coast. You know, I need uh, Linda Ronstadt's agent. You know, I, I need uh, the Eagles to, to play my venue. So it was great. I really had so much fun and learned so much about business and contracts and riders 
I really thought that's what I wanted to do, be the next Bill Graham, Ron Delsner. These were my idols. So, so now what happens is you said, hey, three years of college, it's enough. I don't want to really do this. And then you did what most people around New York and around the country at that time. You went to California. Right. You, you, you wanted to be like the Beach Boys, right? I did. I'll tell you, I wanted to be a Beach Boy. My best friend moved out there. He was going to be a teen star. Uh, not that I thought I was going to be an actor, but living in California, just working, um, odd jobs, you know, hanging out on the beach. I sold ice cream on the beach. Um, I did excavation work, which is just incredible that I actually picked up a shovel and dug a hole. And um, it, it, it messenger, really, right? I was a messenger. I would pick up packages and people from the airports and deliver them. You didn't only stay in L.A. You were in San Francisco. I was Francisco. in L.A. and San Francisco. And in San Francisco, I was really a, right, a courier, like you see you know, all around New York, but not on a bicycle, in a car. And also worked as a waiter in a restaurant there, too. I worked at a store called Beppel's Pie Store on Union Street. And um, I did what I had to so, do. So you, you come back, and you said you had some friends who were in Wall Street. You had other things. And, and you met your friends in Wall Street. And you really didn't see that this was something that, that you really wanted in Wall Street. You know, I remember um, going with my dad and getting a Brooks Brothers suit and um, going up to see my friends at 55 um, Water Street, and they worked at Lehman Brothers. And it was quite a scene. I mean, everybody was on the phone. Everybody was cold calling. Um, it seemed like a lot of action, and I just didn't feel like I was cut out for the finance part of it, the SEC license part of it, the, the, the staying inside and sort of change your desk aspect of it. it just didn't excite me. So then you had your father, your, your uncle, Marvin, right? My, my uncle Stanley. Uncle my Stanley. Stanley Greenstein. Uncle Stanley was a mortgage broker in right. Long Island, and he said, Uncle, tell me what I should do, right? Well, I, I had an idea that with Wall Street not working, the music business in 1981, the compact disc was created, MTV started, and it looked like the music business was going to change completely. Um, live concerts, everybody predicted, would be obsolete. So being a concert promoter, maybe I thought that was going to be a little too much of a grind. So Uncle Stanley, who always did very well, and he was in real estate. But what kind of real estate? He was in mortgage brokerage. I don't think I really understood mortgage brokerage. So I said, well, what about just real estate brokerage or getting into the real estate business? So he gave me a list of people that I should go see. Right, Hubert and Peters and... Uh, Cross and Brown. Advanced Realty. Andover and Realty. Um, Helmsley Spear. Uh, and a company called Garrick Aug. Garrick Aug was different than most of the other companies I saw because they were a retail leasing company and they were the only ones willing to give me a salary. Which was interesting because, as many people know in the real estate business, you know, they say, here's a desk. You're lucky if you get a desk. And here's a phone. And do it. You got a salary. Yes. That and, was my job. And your job was to go out. What did what, what, you do? Well, it was a really a great entry-level job, especially since I was getting $250 a week. I walked the streets of New York. I looked at New York like I had never looked at it before. Growing up on Long Island, I was always sort of enthralled by this the, the city itself, but now to really walk the streets, make maps of the streets, come back to the office, call every single owner of every single building on every single street, and introduce myself and ask them if their space was available, and put together a listings program that I would enter into the computer. So I was outside, I was walking, I was getting exercise, and I was shopping, and I was getting my education and in the you, real estate And you did business. a lot of listings, you said. That's I got 200 listings in three months which I think, still think is a record. So what happens now is because uh, Garrick Org, as you said, was a maverick organization. They had a unique business, which you took to the much higher degree. They were, they were a retail leasing broker in New York City. And there were two principals, right. okay? And uh, Michael Hirschfield and Charlie Org. Uh, so, so what happened? Well, there couldn't have been two more uniquely different people. Uh, Michael was very reserved, stoic, chairman of the company. Charlie was absolutely like a bull in a china shop. He, the guy, was unhinged, but I really liked him. Michael left soon after I was there, uh, but Michael recognized when I got 200 listings after three months that this kid had something and lent me money, lent me $3,000, and said, now you're now going to become a salesperson. So after Michael left, Charlie Aug saw my potential and let me grow into a much more um, senior position as a manager where actually at some point I had about 
20 people working under me. And I was at Garrick Aug for uh, 15 years. At, at Garrick Aug, you know, as many people like to say, your first deal, your first lease that you really did, you never forget. You know, it's, right. there are certain things you remember in life. And your first lease was what? The was deli a, on I remember the attendant, his name was Dr. Cotlier, and he was going into the deli business. And he, we signed a lease at a space on West 47th Street between 5th and 6th. It was just set back, so in New York it's not flush to the street, it's never as valuable. And uh, we rented the deli, and the guy probably paid uh, 10000 a month, and that was my first commission. A week later, I did another deal, Hunter Florist on 3rd Avenue and 53rd Street. And that was, that was exciting also. In that case, I was the agent for the owner. So the deli, I represented the tenant. On the florist deal, I represented the landlord. Now, you told me that there's a, there's a book we call it the Green Book, or right. you, that you would, you would count your deals. And yes. you, you, you'd put the ledger down of how many deals you did each year. And, yeah. and you had this desire to, to double the number each year? Yeah, I, I put the pressure on myself. Well, I, I kept a ledger of every deal I made, and I would write it in, in, in my horrible handwriting in the inside of the Green Real Estate, New York Real Estate Board of New York Diary. And the first year I did 32 deals, and I, and I was excited, but it wasn't enough. And I, I made a goal for myself to try and do double the amount of deals every year. And sure enough, my second year, I did over 64 deals. I think I did about 67 deals. And I mean leasing transactions. Every deal is difficult, whether it's big or small. And I've learned that over the years. But getting the deal done is not a better feeling than actually negotiating, getting everybody to sign a lease, getting your commission agreed to, and then booking it and finishing it. Now, now the interesting thing that you, we were talking about the other day, certain people got specialties, and, and we'll talk about some of the landlords and some of the great deals that you've done, but you became a guy known for Third Avenue, right? right. Well, I tried to pick different neighborhoods where I could dominate and really know, you know, the key in New York, retail real estate, you really need to know everything. You need to know every single development, every single developer, every single new building, old building, what's available, what's not. But Third Avenue w was great. I lived on the Upper East Side, so I'd walk home every day. And I saw, you know, this guy Trump was putting up two buildings, and this guy Eichner was putting up a building, and these fellow the Milsteins were putting up a building, and there were some other uh, spaces that were, used to be supermarkets that, got, that went vacant. And Third Avenue just seemed to be my route home every day. So I said, if that's, the, I'm gonna walk here every day, I wanna see my name up on a sign that says space available, and I wanna make sure I introduce myself to every single one of these owners. Now, what we were saying the other day, and, you know, and, and retail has evolved, even though it's New York City, which, which has the highest retail rent as, a, uh, as reported last week by C.B. Richard Ellis, 1725 a, a square foot, there were not a lot of national retailers here. No. And one of the national retailers, which probably, it must have been 25 years ago that you've been involved with them, or 20 years ago, was The Gap. The right. Gap came to New York, and, and you really took control of The Gap uh, the Banana Republics, uh, the Old Navy, you know, they, their stores. Everything. I became very friendly with the head of real estate for The Gap, a guy named Steve Kaplan, and um, several other people that were there through the years. And I was tenacious. I, was, I, and I had all the information at my fingertips. I worked tirelessly to provide them with information about every single available space. And I was able to make recommendations as to where they should go. So on 3rd Avenue, one of the first big deals we did was an old supermarket. And in supermarkets, the way buildings were built in New York, you think about Embry-Roth and a white brick building on the Upper East Side, there's an enormous amount of columns. And I remember going into the space, it was vacant, with Don Fisher, the chairman and founder of The Gap, and he would look at every site before they'd sign a lease. And he looked at all the space and he looked at all the columns and he said, there's only one thing to do when you have these many columns. I said, what's that, Don? He says, take more space. And they leased 25,000 square feet, the entire block, ground and lower level. They did a Gap, a Gap Kids, a Baby Gap, and a Banana Republic. So I got hot on Third Avenue, too, by meeting uh, other developers. Right. Now, you know, everybody knows you know, the, the legendary... Donald Trump, and you met Donald uh, oh, yeah. because he was building on Third Avenue. Oh yeah, and, uh, he had two apartment houses. Uh, well, 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 I met Donald actually. Um, I got a call from two people in his office um, that uh, asked me to to come up and if I would be interested in helping work on Trump Tower. 
they had you had an agent working on Trump Tower, and it wasn't it wasn't really going that well. Trump was a great name, and Trump Tower was an absolute phenomenon, probably top of every tourist's list that they had to stop in and go into Trump Tower and look at the waterfall and marvel at really you know the, the, the building he built. But the retail had faltered. Um, I came in and worked very closely with Donald's team, and we revived the retail there. We put retail on, um, put, brought in Ferragamo, brought in um, Asprey. We filled up the, the levels. We put in a great restaurant in the lower level. We brought in Tower Records in the lower level to you provide maybe something a little bit more affordable for people. We put sportswear chains on the second, third, and fourth level. We put a hair salon. Donald loved me. So then I became his agent for every building he built. So you were also involved with Donald in the Nike store? Nike, we were the agent for him when uh, Donald bought out Galleries Lafayette, who was doing terribly, which was the former Bonwick Teller, part of the whole story, how he assembled the site. And um, Nike Town had opened in Chicago, wanted to be in New York, what better location? Donald cut an amazing deal where literally they spent 100% of their own money, about $60 million, to gut the building and build what today is Nike Town. Um, when he had Third Avenue in the 60s, same thing. We did the Trump uh, Palace and the Trump Plaza. And uh, really, the last tenant you thought might, he might take as a tenant would be Food Emporium. But I remember playing, um, uh, Marvin Traub had just got involved and bought the Conran Shop. Conran Shop was interested. Food Emporium was interested. We negotiated down to the bitter end, and Food Emporium just paid, uh, you know, about 30% more rent, and Donald made the deal. And it was Food Emporium became very convenient. It became a real, uh, Louis Sunshine used to think, well now, if you bought an apartment in Trump Palace, you had the convenience of a supermarket below, and therefore we could sell the apartments for more money. So it seemed to work for everybody. No, it worked, you know, and, and that was interesting. I've done some shows on my, on my Stoller Report show, and we were talking about, you know, amenities and buildings for apartments. You know, these amenities, you know, do bring certain people to, to the building. If you have the right retail in, in, the, in the store, you know, it's good for an office building, it's good also for a residential building. Absolutely. It creates, you know, life in the neighborhood, and it really is a plus. While you were, you know, with Garrick, you were there until 1998. That's right. Some of the other notable deals that you were doing. Well, I worked um, with uh, bringing Old Navy, their first store, which was 60,000 feet, onto the Ladies' Mile. If you think about the Ladies' Mile, 6th Avenue between 14th to 23rd Street, only Bed Bath Beyond had made the commitment. In, in terms of pioneering. By bringing this big clothing chain, Old Navy, to a former Honda dealership and repair shop uh, was, pr was pretty monumental. And that was, that was one of the biggest, most exciting deals. And, and then you also did Barnes & Nobles for them. Trip. Barnes & Noble um, wanted to have a flagship. They had sort of dominated Fifth Avenue in the Flatiron District, and they wanted to have a bigger store all under one roof, 60,000 square feet on, on 17th Street. Landlord was Lillian Serrell, who had owned the building for felt like 100 years with her late husband. The building was completely you know, filled with pigeons and dust and wood joices that was falling apart. Barnes loved the location. Demchik teamed up with the related companies and opened their flagship store. That's how I met the related companies. So it's 1998, and at that time you were also dabbling in real estate with one of your buddies in Florida, yes. in, uh, on Miami Beach, and you decide to Futterman was the name anyway on the signs. It used to say Robert K. Futterman, Garrick Org. Right. And he said, no, it's going to be Robert K. Futterman, my company. Right. So what happened? In, in after a, a couple of other really big deals I did with uh, related, I mentioned, down at Union Square, we put in Virgin Records, Circuit City, UA Theaters, and then I did a 90,000-foot um, Bed Bath Beyond deal at First Avenue and 61st Street with the Milsteins. For years, I've been, the last few years, I've been trying to buy Garrick Og. I really wanted to own it. I brought in partners as diverse as Goldman Sachs, Federal Realty. They were all ready to back me to buy Garrick Og. I just couldn't make a deal with Charlie. So in 1998, uh, my friend David Edelstein said, you know, you're so smart and good at retail. Let's go down and buy some buildings on Lincoln Road in Miami, which was a bustling thoroughfare, pedestrian mall, um, similar to Third Street Promenade in California and Santa Monica, and let's say even, you know, Fulton Street in Brooklyn. So. We looked when we bought four buildings and we teamed up with Credit Suisse First Boston. Credit Suisse at the time was run by a guy named Andy Stone 
who was out doing all kinds of real estate deals in New York. He was backing the, the Whitcoffs, the Solomons, the Macklows, you name it. Some of the biggest names in, in real estate then and, and now. And Credit Suisse guys, they, they thought this was a great idea. Why don't we buy in to Robert, let him start his own company, which he wants to do anyway, uh, put up the money, and then we'll get to look at all these great opportunities for deals. And that was the genesis of the formation of Robert K. Futterman and Associates in uh, July of 1998. And um, it, was, it was probably the, the scariest moment of my life to actually pick up, leave, start my own company. I looked at guys like Edward S. Gordon as my role model in terms of who I wanted to be and how I wanted to run a company, which was a very sort of, you know, tucked in, always have a briefcase, suit and tie every day, go to work, and uh, use my initials as the name. And so it was pretty ballsy, and uh, it, ended up, it ended up working pretty well. I got about 10 people that joined me soon after that left Garrick Aug, I was able to cherry pick some of the top talent from, at that point, ESG, Cushman and Wakefield, Lansko, Newmark, and we formed our own company. Now, you said to me 9-11 uh, was a turning point also for, for, for Robert K. Fundament. What happened? Well, I mean, um, aside from you know, being in the city that day and the, the devastation and having to walk 100 blocks to get a car to, just to go home uh, where my kids lived in uh, Connecticut, it was it was just life changing, and uh, in the aftermath of 9/11, it, it, it just felt like the phone didn't ring. And I don't mean a week or two weeks or three weeks, but it felt like the New York business just wasn't going anywhere. So, my um, president of my company at the time, a guy named Steve Yaloff, and I, we realized that we looked at our business and we said so much of it is based on relationships that we have with tenants, national tenants that want to be. Um, in New York, why don't we take those relationships and take them around the country? Let's go with p the Polos of the world, the Barnes and Nobles of the world, the Gaps, the Nine Wests, the cosmetic companies, the shoe companies, the retailers we represent, and help them expand throughout the country. One of my partners, after, n after about six months, decided to move to California, Robert Cohn. And uh, shortly after that, we opened an office in LA. So we really started focusing our business on a national basis. And it started working. It started clicking. We spent an enormous amount of money giving ourselves a higher profile nationally through trade magazines, through public relations, through advertising and mailing. And people started to associate RKF with national retail leasing. Yeah, you know, really over the last 13 years. But you've been involved with certain major complexes. I think many people, including myself, what, what really weren't sure how the retail would do at the Time Warner Center. Uh, I remember writing one of my articles and basically saying, do you think it'll be okay you know, one year after? And, you know, it was. And you, you were responsible for all of the leasing. Let's talk about that. You know, I'll tell you, retail, vertical retailing in New York has always been taboo. Um, no, there were never any success stories. Um, 575 Fifth was built with a retail atrium that nobody visited. The Herald Center tried to build right in probably one of the greatest locations in the world, across from Macy's. And that a was a failure. Multiple level, seven, eight level uh, retail box by calling each level a different street. Um, called it Soho or called it Columbus Avenue or called it Times Square and called it, didn't matter what they called it, nobody went. It didn't work. They tried to be high end in a very, um, pe pedestrian but middle America location like where Macy's is across the street, which is to this day one of the greatest retailing destinations in the world. When you put a vertical mall there, it still didn't work. The uh, Manhattan Mall, as it's called today, uh, again, had a, had a Stearns as a, an anchor and um, the Attorney General at the time, Oliver Capel, based on a merger between Macy's and A&S, and Stern, uh, uh, excuse me, there was an, an A&S plan to put a moratorium against um, it staying in A&S. So they had to change it to a Stern's. Stern's went out of business. The Manhattan Mall had no anchor, another dud. So Time Warner Center, when w Related One was awarded the development rights to Columbus Circle, the, for, you know, the uh, former New York, you know, I guess, um, convention 
uh, center, the Coliseum, excuse Coliseum. Me, the Coliseum site, as we love to call it. Um, I was working with them on several other projects, and so they brought me in and my team to help them determine value, how many square feet they should build, how many levels it should be, and target a certain type of tenant. Our first um, attempt to market the retail was to go very high end. You're talking Prada, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Cartier, and if we were going to have a big anchor tenant, it was going to be a department store. It was going to be Harrods, it was going to be Harvey Nichols, or maybe it was going to be Bloomingdale's West, but it was going to be maybe Nordstrom's first store. That was the focus of the marketing. They were going to build a very elaborate food hall similar to Harrods in London. And what happened is, as we got out into the marketplace, we started talking to tenants, and although we were relating the comparables to neighborhoods like Soho and Fifth Avenue at a more affordable rent, much more common, moderately priced tenants showed interest. Coach, Armani Exchange, J. Crew, Borders Books, Whole Foods, which really solved a lot of issues. Whole Foods came in, looked at the entire lower level, 55,000 feet, and Related looked at that deal as they didn't have to go spend the money on the food hall, they were getting a credit tenant to take all of it. Well, that lease, I think, sat on Steve Ross's desk for about a year before he signed it because it was never the developer's vision to have Whole Foods as an anchor. And the Whole Foods is probably the best reason for the success of the shop. And it's got to be a big contributor to it. Right now, Time Warner Center, I mean, the sales are over $1,400 a foot. It's absolutely one of the greatest success stories in retailing. It's vertical, it's, four, it's five levels, and it works. You were also involved with, you know, Apple is Apple. You've been involved with the two major Apple projects in New York City. You've been involved with the, the one that no one thought would ever work at the GM building, uh, and also the Apple at the 14th Street for Taconic. Right, well, Taconic zeroed in on Apple, and um, Apple had a desire after the I, um, the um, GM building to open uh, a really hip store downtown. It really made the neighborhood, the meatpacking district, uh, what it is today. But the deal at the GM building was absolutely incredible. Apple had a desire to be in New York and was only interested in Fifth Avenue between 49th Street, Saks Fifth Avenue, and 57th Street. That was the core, no pun intended, of Fifth Avenue. Harry Macklow dragged me to the pit at the GM building, which Donald Trump had, had sort of brassed over, but used to be this astroturf fielded space that was a dud. And he had a vision to convince Apple to bring them to this location. He wanted them to work on an element. Okay. Apple came up with an idea. Today you have the Apple store. Okay. You, you've done some interesting things. It's nice that your mother and father are still alive, yes, living in Jericho. You have two sons. I do. Jesse one, and Kevin. And uh, hopefully one day uh, they may join you. It's possible. Uh, and uh, Robert, you've truly been a uh, builder of New York. And thank you for being thank here today. Thank you very much. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, F.J. Siami Construction, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Markham LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, 
Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. Thank <laughs> you.